Hi everyone and welcome to the second of my Halloween 2015 videos. Uh, this one is going to use a clock that I actually broke when I was making the Christmas clock that I have shared already on my YouTube channel. So if you've already seen that little um, white snowy clock, this was the one I was originally working on and I managed to break the glass and because I wanted the glass intact I couldn't carry on using this clock but I knew it would come in handy, I didn't throw it away. Now the problem is if you have one of these Tim Holtz assemblage or assemblage clocks um, your glass will be intact so you're going to need to undo the screws on the inside and take the glass out if you want to make this project. Just be very careful not to catch yourself on the glass and uh, gather together all your Halloween supplies. Now, I did think I was going to use these little skeletons and I had an idea that I was going to make them pop out of the inside of the clock but uh, that uh, idea I'm going to keep hold of for perhaps for next Halloween because I go with something a little bit different. So sometimes that's what happens, you start out with one idea in mind and crafting and the nature of crafting takes you in a completely different direction. So I've just gathered together some Halloween bits and pieces, these are from Tim Holtz, these are quite new and uh, you can see also in the background I've got some of Tim Holtz's new skulls as well from his ideology range. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to use some of these on my clock. So although this is a small project it was quite intricate so it will take a little while to um, complete the entire project and you might want to do this over a couple of days. I certainly did. Um, I know I had designing time in between the actual creating time but you know you've got paints and things to let dry and uh, little bits and pieces to create to put inside the clock. So I'm going to try and give you best I can the highlights of everything that I did to create this gorgeous spooky clock. and. Um, without you know giving you too much information and making this video really really long. So the first thing that we're going to do is look at a technique of turning something into something that looks like stone and if you've watched the video that I posted just the other day you will have seen this technique in action. It's exactly the same technique but done on a more complicated more complicated shape. So I'm going to be using crunched up or scrunched up tissue paper. It can be any colour tissue paper because we're going to paint it and I'm just tearing it into more manageable chunks. I'm going to be using a Ranger matte medium to apply my tissue paper and the idea is to cover my clock and to create texture whilst I wrap it in this tissue paper. So what you're going to need to do is add a layer of the matte medium and add your scrunched up tissue. It's the little folds in the tissue that we're after because we're going to create a stone effect and you can see I'm encouraging those little folds in the paper or wrinkles in the paper where they occur. You're going to have to be a little bit careful about covering some of the more um, shapely parts of your clock like the little legs and the bells and the handle but it just take your time it's easily done if you have a gap you just add more glue and then you add more tissue paper so you're just going to work your way around your clock each time you have a layer of tissue paper you cover that piece of tissue paper with the matte multi-medium and work your way around your clock. So I'm going to put this into fast forward so you can see what I do. If you wanted to you could actually take the bells of this clock off um, and that would make things a little bit easier but it's entirely up to you how you handle the covering of this project. You just want to cover the whole thing on the outside with a layer of wrinkly tissue paper. Now it's up to you whether you decide to wrap the tissue onto the inside or not. You're really not going to see it once this clock has been put together. But I did try to add a little bit over the very front edge of the clock and that did mean that I tended to wrap it round onto the inside. So you probably need to use your brush to make sure that you can pop things underneath those bells because your fingers aren't going to fit and that's where if you really do feel the need you could take those bells off. So the black marks that are appearing on my tissue is just because I'm working on a dirty mat. <laughs> 
so nothing to worry about because I'm going to be painting this once it has been covered. So for the smaller areas that we're covering as we move towards the top of the clock, you're going to need smaller pieces of tissue to make this job more manageable. I'm using things like my barbecue skewer and my paintbrush to just tuck the ends of the tissue to the underside of the bell and it will help me get my fingers into those places that I can't reach because I have uh, kept the bells attached. Once your clock is entirely covered in the tissue, just adding a little bit more to the front edge of this clock, then you're going to put it to one side to dry. Now whilst that's drying, I'm going to show you how to make the gl glittery blood drips that appear on this clock. So we're starting out with a layer of glitter and I've gone for a sort of deeper, darker red. And then I'm using my glue gun to create trails of blood. So the aim is to have a little bit of a bobble of glue at the bottom of the drip of blood and then just trail it off into a thinner, um, so you get a drip shape of glue into that layer of glitter. So work on a couple of the droplets at a time because you don't want the glue to dry before you sprinkle more of the glitter over the top of those little trails. They're gonna form very glittery um, and very glamorous blood that we're gonna drip all over the outside of our clock. Have a look at the picture at the beginning of this video so you can judge just how many of these drips you need to make if you're going to use these on your clock. They're quite easy. You do need a glue gun that you can um, sort of control a little bit. Some of them are a little bit more temperamental than others, I know. Keep your fingers out of that hot glue um, until it is cooled and make sure that you've got a lovely bed of glitter that you're going to create those strands and drips of glue on top of and as I said remember to work in batches make some of the drips longer than others although we can alter that once we come to put that onto the clock and then once you've got a batch of those hot glue drips down in the glitter before they completely set then get hold of your glitter pot and cover them with more glitter it's important to be working on a non-stick craft sheet because if you work on paper you'll, you may find that those little drops of glue go through the glitter and onto the paper in which case you'll find it very difficult to get them off again and they will be covered in paper rather than glitter. So work on a non-stick craft sheet and obviously this is a little bit messy so for those of you who aren't keen on having bits of glitter all over you um, this may be one step you want to give a miss. But once you've given that a few minutes for your glue to cool down, I would say probably about at least five to be safe and maybe ten to be sure. And then, if you're impatient like me, <laughs> uh, then you just need to fish through all that glitter and rescue those little glittery strands, which once they're in place on the clock will look like glittery blood dripping over the little spooky landscape you're going to create. So I'm just putting them all to one side ready to use later. Make sure you clear away all that glitter before you start painting your clock. Make sure your clock is nice and dry before you start adding that acrylic paint. So we're going to try and recreate the look of stone all over our clock and I'm going to start that with a base coat of grey. This could be any shade of grey you like. If you don't like this project as dark as I've done it, you could just lighten your base coat and make your stone look lighter and everything will follow suit. Everything that you put within it, you want to adjust according to the shade that you get on the outside of your clock. And it's just a case of working all the way around your clock and covering up all that tissue. So the advantage for me of using that yellow tissue is it's really easy to see if I miss a spot, particularly working underneath those bells. So I'm just mixing my own shades of colour, you could use a grey paint if you want to, 
but uh, I find it handy when you're doing this technique to be able to mix lots of different shades of grey. You can see I'll be mixing my paint on this little bit of old packaging. I think it probably held some dyes uh, one time along the along its lifespan, but I find these work really well um, as paint palettes and you can just throw them away once you're finished with them. Or not, as you can see, I've already used this one before. I'm also painting the inside of my clock, but I didn't really need to because we are going to be covering it with a cardboard inner once we get to that point. Once your base coat is dry, you're ready to start applying more and more layers of paint to achieve this sort of faux stone effect. And you'll find as you try this out, as I said previously on the potion bottle that I made, the more you work it, the more realistic it tends to look. So I'm creating a kind of yellowy shade of grey. I'm using a warm white, a burnt umber and, is it burnt umber? Raw umber, not burnt umber, and um, a black acrylic paint and mixing various shades of paint with those three components. So you can see here, first of all, I'm just giving a light covering of this sort of yellowy grey. This is going to lighten up my stone effect and it's also going to allow me to leave little bits of the darker grey showing through and I'm doing that by sort of brushing on a little bit of paint and then rubbing the paint out with my fingers sort of making it spread further by rubbing it into the clock base with my finger. And I'm going to work that colour all the way around the clock and then over those bells. And then I'm coming back in and adding different shades of grey to the clock base. Again with the same technique though, I'm sort of just creating little patches of light and dark. So I've mixed sort of three shades of the grey paint, dark, medium and light and then I'm just smudging them on in different areas, just creating patches of different shades of grey around my clock. Once you've created all those different shaded areas, then it's time to start stippling different shades of the grey paint onto your clock. So you want quite a scruffy brush in order to do this, and perhaps a stenciling brush would work quite well and you're going to just pounce colour onto your clock base. Now I found that I try to use either a lighter or darker shade of the paint than the patch that I was stippling on top of. So if I had a dark area of paint I was going to be using a medium or a light paint stipple in that area so you're constantly switching between the different colors you don't need to wash your brush in between and you're just stippling more texture onto the areas of shade and light that you've already created on the base of your clock it's all about creating textures making something look like a piece of stone so it's a good idea every now, now and again to stop and put your clock to one side, look at it from a distance and check out whether you're achieving your aim. If not, just go back to it. You'll see the patches that need a little bit extra work. You can see here now, I'm kind of dry brushing a little bit of the black paint onto the clock. So I'm keeping the paint on my finger quite dry and I'm just catching the raised areas of the tissue with the black and that has the effect of making those wrinkles that we put into the tissue into sort of veins in the stonework. So you may have heard of the term dry brushing. Well, I'm doing that, but I'm doing it with my finger so that I can get into all those nooks and crannies. If you make a mistake and smudge more of the colour on than you intended, you can quickly wipe it off with a baby wipe and then carry on. So again, if you get any areas of dark, you can just lighten them up again with a different shade of the paint that you're using.
Now, after having a little look at my handiwork, I decided just to add some lighter highlights in exactly the same way as I did with the black. And I'm just running some of the white, which I'm just rubbing into a pale gray, and then very, very gently rubbing it in the areas that I think would be naturally highlighted on this clock. So paying particular attention to that clock face or where the clock face would have been. Exactly the same. If you make a mistake and get a little bit more paint on there than you intended, you can just rub it off with a wet baby wipe. So the next step is entirely optional. You may decide that you've got enough sort of veins going on with your tissue and dry brushing your tissue, or you could choose to add some more sort of in-depth wrinkles. I'm just practicing my, not wrinkles, veins in my stonework. Let's just say that this was a, a slab of old um, marble or something like that, which would have veins in it. And I'm just using a liner brush and some very watery black paint and then dragging it randomly around the clock just to create some hint of cracking or veins in the old stone. It's a bit like drawing trees. <laughs> there are lots of tree branches all around your spooky clock. So if you find that your vein work is a little bit too prominent once it starts to dry, you can always take again a damp cloth or a damp baby wipe and just lightly knock them back by rubbing over them slightly with the cloth. Once you're happy with your stonework, then it's time to put your clock to one side to dry and start working on the inner. So I've got a piece of quite thin board. It's not chipboard exactly. It was the back of an old uh, 12 by 12 scrapbook pad. It's got some body to it, but it's not too thick to curve carefully around the inside of the clock. So what you're going to do is cut a strip or two strips of the card as I'm doing here and you want it to sit around the inside of your clock but not protrude past the actual back of the clock so you want it to be about half a centimeter less than the width of the clock measuring from the front face of the clock to the back opening watch this through it'll be apparent why you're going to cut these strips slightly shallower than the depth of your clock. Once the strips are cut you're going to put your clock onto your piece of cardboard with the back against the cardboard and you're going to use a pencil to draw around the inside of the base of the clock to transfer that exact shape to the cardboard and once you cut this out, it should fit perfectly into the back of your clock. So once this is all cut out, sorry, I'm disappearing a bit off camera here. You should be able to pop this in to the back of your clock so you can see how it naturally wants to sit into your clock so you need to make sure that those strips don't stop 
that cardboard backing sitting nicely inside your clock. So if it's pushing outwards a little bit then just trim the width of those strips around just a tiny bit. I decided I want to use the word Halloween from the Wicked Alpha Parts by Tim Holt so I've taken that off the plastic carrier and I'm going to add some of that gorgeous red glitter that we used earlier to make our blood splatters. Next I want to add some of that gorgeous red glitter to these Halloween letters so I'm trying to leave a black edge and I'm using my cosmic shimmer glue to sort of trace over the letters of the word Halloween. So you can see that I'm really trying hard to just leave a very fine black edge all the way around as I add this glue. So you need a glue with um, slightly runny consistency so you can do this. You could use um, glossy accents, that would work quite well. Something with a fine applicator to add your glue and then you're going to sprinkle the whole area with some of that dark red glitter. So I'm just popping that should have done it first onto a piece of paper to catch the glue. Just reapplying where I've just scraped it with my fingers. And then shaking on some of that lovely dark red glitter. Now you could put this to one side to dry um, so that you don't smear your work but I managed to get hold of mine I'm tapping off the excess so I can show you how fabulous that looks covered in that gorgeous red glitter. So I've placed these two strips that I cut earlier that are going to go around the inside of my clock and I've decided how much extra I need to make a strip that goes all the way around. I'm making sure that I've got plenty of a or a good overlap as I join these two together because we're going to be curling them around the inside of the clock. I want to make sure they've got good adhesion and that they're stuck well together before I pop them inside the clock. And I've decided again to go with more glitter and I'm going to create some red and black stripes around this piece I'm just going to go around the inside of the clock. You could use this technique for other crafting projects for instance you could make stripey glittery card to add um, and use in your card making or your scrapbooking but uh, I'm going to be using this to put on the inside of my clock so I'm being very careful to keep those double-sided tape strips right next to each other I don't want any gaps and obviously the width of the tape will determine the width of the stripe of glitter that goes around this, the inside of my clock. So once I've got my double sided tape down then I'm just burnishing it to make sure it's well and truly stuck to that cardboard with the back of my scissors. You could also use a bone folder if you want to. And then I'm just trimming off the excess before I start glittering. You're going to need to work this in two parts and I would do the black glitter which is the darkest glitter first. So I've removed half of the backing of the double sided tape and then I removed the second half and I'm making sure that I burnish that glitter into those sticky strips using my finger. Once again uh, not for those who do not like to be covered in glitter. As it is going everywhere. Then once I'm happy that I've got most of the excess off including rubbing um, any static pieces of glitter that have stuck to the backing of the double sided tape, clear up your area and get ready to repeat the process with your red glitter. Again working in two halves, removing that backing tape. You can see what lovely stripes of black we have once we remove that tape and then adding the red. And because you've already got the black, black in place, once you tap off that glitter, you should have some gorgeous red and black stripes. And don't forget to burnish that glitter into those, into that double-sided tape and just check for any 
pieces that you might have missed before you pack uh, your glitter back into its pot and we're ready to work on the backing. Now at this point if I'd have had a compass to hand <laughs> I was thinking of all sorts of ways that I could do concentric circles on the back make this look like a glittery target but it wasn't working for me I couldn't find it so I'm going to freehand a spiral and I end up liking this better it's a little bit weird and wacky and that's what Halloween is all about so I'm drawing a freehand spiral into the center of this circle and then I'm kind of just giving myself a guide to how much of um, a swirl of black I'm going to put onto my base card and then once I'm happy with that I'm going to start adding the glue to the non-shaded area ready to cover it with glitter. Now if your glue dries really quick you need, might need to uh, do this in sections but because I'm keeping the Cosmic Shimmer glue quite thick it's allowing me enough time to go carefully around that spiral. I'm trying to be as neat as possible, not trying not to leave any holes if I can help it and this will form the first part of my spiral so just using my finger to fill in any gaps that I've spotted and then adding that black glitter so at this point you could tidy up any straggly areas of glitter I'm just using my craft knife to do that and then while that's drying, I'm going to show you how to make gravestones. <laughs> so I'm going to make myself a series of gravestones. And I'm starting out by making a simple round-topped gravestone that I want to fit inside the aperture of this clock. So this is just my sort of tester for size at the moment. This is ordinary chipboard that I'm using. And I'm just working on this piece and getting it to the right size to fit on the inside of the clock and I'm just doubling up my chipboard or should I say trebling up my chipboard so that they're nice and chunky and look dimensional inside my clock so once I've established rough sort of dimensions that any of my gravestones need to have I know I want three in total and I want them to be different shapes so I had a quick look online at the different shapes um, and sizes of gravestone that you get and picked out a couple that I'm going to try and make to add to my little collection. So I'm starting out by trying a cross shape. So again I keep looking at the one that I've already made to make sure that the sort of width and height dimensions are very similar even though the shape is different and then it's a case of cutting this out and then layering them up and cutting them out again so I'm going to do that three times in order to get the same depth of gravestone as I achieved on my first rounded gravestone so this is the um, next shape of gravestone that I've chosen. Uh, the internet is a really great place to uh, look for different shapes. I just looked under Google Images, put in the word gravestones and there were lots of different shapes that uh, you could use as inspiration for making the gravestones for this clock. So I'm just taking a little bit of time to make sure that these are going to fit inside my clock and then I'm going to layer them up so that they are as thick as the initial gravestone that I made.
As I started to work on making these two pieces thicker, I realised that the glitter swirl had dried. So I'm just using my craft knife now that that glue is dry just to scrape off a couple of little areas, bumpy areas around my freehand swirl. And I'm going to knock off the excess and then fill in that second swirl and I'm going to fill all of that space with that gorgeous red glitter. And again I'm just checking for any little holes that I may have left behind because I don't want anything to show other than that gorgeous glitter swirl and then sprinkling on all that gorgeous red glitter so each time you layer up one of these little gravestones you're going to keep cutting them out until you get your three layers and this is where I start to look at the composition of those gravestones and where they're going to sit inside the clock and I'm going to need to round off some of the edges of the gravestones because I want to make them come in at different angles to the um, clock aperture as if they're a little bit higgledy-piggledy as we look into the clock. First of all I'm going to attach that red and black glittery striped surround into place so that I can work on that. And because of the way the clock is angled I'm going to put the overlap of that little strip towards the top of the clock because I think that's the place where it's least likely to be seen. And then I'm just securing that all in place with a little bit of hot glue. Remember that none of that working is going to show once we put the back onto the clock itself. So this may be a little bit difficult to see on camera as uh, obviously I can't hold this in position whilst I'm holding things inside the clock so that I can see what's going on but I think you get the gist of exactly what I'm doing. I'm rounding off the edges of the pieces so that they sit on that rounded edge of the clock. So I'm going to keep the plain gravestone in the centre and then have the two more unusual shaped gravestones coming in from the side. So this is a case of trial and error. Keep working those shapes and I'm going to be working at three different levels in the clock, one at the front, one in the middle and one towards the back. So you can really see some depth as you look into this sort of faux graveyard effect inside the clock. And now I'm happy with the size and shape of my gravestones, it's time to turn them to stone. And this is exactly the same technique as we did on the clock itself, so using tissue and paint to turn these projects to stone. And I'm choosing to cover them on the back and the front even though once the back of the clock's in place you won't be able to see the back of the gravestones. And then once all that tissue has covered those little gravestones, I'm going to put them to one side to dry. And once they're dry, I just had a look through all the little embellishments that I've got and decided how I was going to further enhance these gravestones, make them look even spookier. And some of these items I'm going to stick on before I actually paint them so that they become 
painted uh, as I cover those gravestones with the acrylic paint. So I've got a little bat and a little spider that come from that uh, wicked alpha parts from Tim Holtz as well as the little skull. And then I'm going to go through that little packet of letters again and see if I can find an RIP. There we go. I'm going to glue those into place and then I'm going to get started with the painting. And because we've covered the painting in detail on the clock, all I'm going to say is it's exactly the same but on a smaller scale. So base coating first, I'm going to be trying to make each of the stones a slightly different shade of grey, but then I'm going to carry on texturising them in exactly the same way as we did for the clock. So once you've done that and you're happy with the stone texture that you've created, and then you can go back and add in the details so you can choose to highlight the little items that you've added for extra interest so I'm just creating a little shadow just to make that bat shape pop out even further and then I'm just going to lighten him slightly Then I'm going to take a liner brush and I'm going to write the initials B R B. This is one that I had to ask my son. I think it's a little bit funny. <laughs> Be right back. For those of you that are well up on your internet speak. And it just popped into my head so I'm going to be using it just to add a little bit of humour to my graveyard scene. So again just trying to bring a little bit of depth by adding light and shade. And interest to each of these gravestones. Adding lots of lovely cracks to the cross gravestone. Not angry, just cross. <laughs> I don't think there'll be any laughter in this uh, graveyard at my jokes. And then last but not least, I'm just going to add some texture and some shading to this gravestone. And of course, I'm going to stick the skull to the top of it. As well as decorating the little gravestone with a skull, I'm going to use a combination of these Tim Holtz skulls and the ring skulls that I used on my potion bottle in the previous video to add some more interest to my clock. I do like to see these skulls with gemstone eyes, so I'm going to be adding red this time round for a really spooky look and to match in with the red glitter that I'm already using on this project. But this time I'm using some glue and just popping in some little red gems. Once that glue dries it will dry clear. Again, this is going to be a little bit tricky to show you. I'll keep turning the clock as I go. But I'm sticking those gravestones into position and I'm using hot glue. Because we've made them more dimensional by having the three layers of chipboard, it's quite easy to run a layer of glue along the bottom of the gravestone and make sure that it sticks to all that glitter. I'm using hot glue for that reason. We don't want these to come away. And anywhere that it touches the side of this project I'm adding another little dot of glue just to make sure that they're nice and secure but that central gravestone is literally secured 
by its base to the curve of the clock. Almost at the point where I can put this back piece into position but I wanted to make sure it had some Halloween character as well and I'm going to be attaching it to this piece of paper so I'm just adding glue to the back of my glittery spiral and then I'm going to stick it to this skull and bones um, scrapbooking paper. And once it's trimmed out you can attach it to the back of your clock. It just pops in and if you've got something that doesn't fit you could add a little dot of glue to hold it in place but I quite like the fact that I can take it off if I want to and perhaps I could add other elements to the inside of the clock at a later date so I'm not going to attach it it's sitting there quite nicely and now it's time to add those final embellishments so I'm going to pretend that this is a clock face because this is a clock so I'm adding the skulls at the nine 12 and 3 o'clock point. Obviously I can't do the 6 o'clock because I've got my Halloween, the word Halloween across the bottom of the clock. And then instead of the numbers I'm going to attach some little red gems. I did try all other colours but uh, I thought the red looked nicest so I didn't really want to introduce perhaps a white or a grey. And the red ones were just the right size. So just attaching them in position with a little dot of hot glue to make sure they stay where I want them. one of them's dropped inside and disappeared into that <laughs> spiral to another world because I can't find it so I'm gonna have to use one that's as near as I can match it doesn't look too bad on camera so hopefully you never know when I tidy up a bit later on I might find it and be able to switch it back in toy with the idea of tying on some of this black tinsel and adding some charms to the end but it was getting a little bit fussy so you see I will remove that shortly but until then I'm going to be adding my red blood drips dripping down from the edge of the clock almost fit making a kind of spooky curtain over the scene. So again it's a little bit awkward to show you on camera but I'm attaching these with the tiniest tiniest dot of the hot glue and I'm just grouping them together to make a sort of pleasing effect. I'm kind of going for the, the two puddles of blood coming from underneath each of the bells. <laughs> it's funny to be talking about puddles of blood so matter-of-factly but uh, after all this isn't real blood. It's got glitter! So if you put too much of a big blob of glue onto these pieces then obviously they will start to melt themselves so just be a little bit careful as to how you attach them into position. If they're a bit long you can cut them down um, because this glue easily cuts with a pair of scissors. So these dangly drips of uh, blood need to have come from somewhere so now I'm drawing on exactly where they've come from with the cosmic shimmer glue so I've got some sort of dripping off the front of the clock and then I'm adding some further drips down the side I'm keeping the glue nice and thick so they do form their own droplets at the same time and making sure some of those join up with the uh, glue drips that have come off the front of the clock now this is where you're going to get a little bit of glue glitter into the inside of your clock but it will all tap out because it's got nothing to attach to once you're happy with the placement of the rest of this glitter blood and then I'm going to repeat that on the opposite side so I would wait until the glue has thoroughly dried before I really give it a good tap to get all of that excess glue that might have fallen into the inside of the clock because if you tap it too vigorously while the glue is still 
sort of quite thick and wet you may find that you get it to drip somewhere that you don't want it to so do your best not to get it into the clock but it's inevitable that some will removed that bit of tinsel I'll put that to one side and use that later and then I'm going to add the final finishing touch which is those red gems into the eyes of the three skulls that are around the edge of the clock and you can see how great those drips look now they've all become one and they look like they're oozing out of underneath the bells of this clock perhaps I should have a scary sound effect around about now <laughs> so the skulls are getting their eyes try not to drop any more into the clock And then I'm adding two more little red dots on the top of this clock because it's looking a bit boring from this angle. It needs a little bit of red. <laughs> so two more red gems and then it's on to the cobwebs. And I really love this next technique I'm about to show you. And anybody that's used a hot glue gun, we're going to use the thing that we think of as being a pain normally to our advantage and that is the strings that the hot glue leaves behind when you're trying to glue things onto uh, other projects and you can take advantage of this by creating the strings where you want cobwebs. Now I know this really isn't going to show up very much on camera so I'm just going to give you an overview of the way that I'm doing it. Thinking about where cobwebs would naturally fall on something that had been sat there a very very long time and then I'm just touching from one side to the other as if a spider had been busily building a web in a particular corner or area of this clock and you will see that you will get a series of fine fine strands of glue and it's those strands of glue that as you can see here on the clock face as I go across crisscross here from one side to the other build up to form what looks like cobwebs it really does look fab and it's a real great addition to any Halloween piece so I'm just pretending that I've got tons of spiders working their magical webs on this clock and I'm adding them in as many places as I can think of to put them um, that kind of falls in with the design I've already got. I'm being very careful not to touch the glue that is forming those uh, glittery blood droplets because I don't want to remelt those. I think I'm happy with the amount of cobwebs that I've got and I'm going to call this job done. The only other thing that I'm going to do is just lightly tack that back of the clock into position with some teeny tiny dots of glue and that's only because I'm quite happy with this how it is I don't think I'm going to go back to it and I don't want the back to fall out so by adding some tiny dots of glue to the back it means that it will stay safe even if somebody picks this up to have a look inside so I'm just I'm going to tack that in position with this glue gun. Make sure that before you do this your patterned paper is the right way around and then I'm going to call that finished and I'm really pleased with how this has turned out and I hope that it gives you tons and tons of inspiration on what you could do to turn uh, this Tim Holtz clock into a piece of Halloween spooky decor that you can get out year after year and decorate your home as the witching hour approaches. So I've been leaving links throughout this video so that you can look at other Halloween projects that I've created. I've created another spooky bottle which you'll see a photograph of at the end of this and um, there is a Halloween playlist if you want to just get them all in one go. 
So I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to hit the like button, the subscribe button, the share button, all of those buttons that help me promote my channel if you like the work that I'm doing here and the projects that I'm sharing with you. I think this deserves one more spooky sound effect before I sign off. Thank you for watching.